Majora's Mask. Chapter 45. The Pirate's Fortress. The wind howled, bearing sleet that peddled endlessly on the desolate northern landscape. An imp watched from the mouth of his perfectly circular cave, huddled by a fireplace near the entrance. His dark mask reflected the flames. How long ago did I bring Tattle here? The Skull Kid wondered. He recalled her begging them to turn back when they were halfway through. He dragged her to the end anyways. I had to prove to her that she was a shadow, he thought. I had to show her the perfection that waits Termina. The cave had tricked her too. He wondered if she'd shared those dark illusions with the boy yet. Will she hate me forever because I did that? The Skull Kid thought. Not that it mattered. He shifted on the rock floor, adjusting his back against the wall. Dark Link was on its way to two adventures now. Hmm. We should start heading south, the Skull Kid said. In case your shadow fails. Do you lack faith in me? Majora said. It was a dangerous question. The Skull Kid swallowed, drawing his knees close. No, I lack faith in the shadow. I should be the one killing the boy. You have already failed me too many times, and my demon possesses the Ocarina's magic. This shadow is the superior warrior. Why should we be using any magic that's not yours? The imp asked. I thought only your magic could purify corruption. There was no immediate response, which scared the Skull Kid. Go to him, then. The imp hesitated. He uncertainly stood to leave, but he closed his eyes first to concentrate. Suddenly, he saw Sand peering through the eyes of his servant. Keep going, the Skull Kid told the shadow. Then, he opened his eyes and flew into the snowy landscape. His assassin was almost there. Maybe Dark Link would kill the boy in time. Link stepped onto Great Bay's shore again. He wore Mikau's form as he looked at the nearby fisherman's hut. Epona was reined to the wall, drinking from a pail of water. When she noticed Azora, she didn't appear interested in his appearance. That way? Tattle asked, flying up beside him. She pointed south down the beach, which was a direction they'd never taken before. Yes. Link said in Mikau's wavering voice. They hiked that way together, satisfied by his horse's treatment. Once they rounded a rock wall, Great Bay's other side presented itself. The sand quickly transitioned into dark, slick rock forming a new shoreline. The waves crashed against it and the underwater rocks nearby, making the territory dangerous. One slip could be fatal, even as Zora. Do Zoras have sticky feet? Tattle asked. What? Link asked, furrowing his brow. You know, like webbed feet, so you don't slip as easy. Link shook his head. Zoras aren't frogs, Tattle. Well, how am I supposed to know these things? She sighed. Come on, let's get this over with. Just watch your step. Link did, walking carefully forward. The rocky shore was a pathway twisting around columns and caves, perpetually blocking out what lay ahead. The ocean continued foaming and swirling to their left. I can see why no one's come this way looking for Zora eggs, the boy thought. Even before reaching the fortress, this pathway was dangerous. Tattle's mind was clearly elsewhere, though. Do you realize this is only the twentieth day we've known each other? Link frowned. He kept his footing as he rounded another corner, jealous of her ability to zone out as she flew over this. <laughs> no way, he said. Twenty days can't be right. About that long, at least, the fairy said. When you took that nap in Zora Hall, I did the math myself. Keeping track of days is kind of hard when we're reliving the same ones. But only twenty? Well, we left in the middle of some days, so it's hard to be exactly right. But even counting the cycle we spent in Snowhead when we weren't together, it's been twenty days since we met. 
That's crazy, Link said. I feel like it's been forever. Twenty days ago, I'd never heard of Majora's Mask. Well, twenty-three days for you, Tattle said. Remember, you didn't spend those first three days with this version of me. Oh, right, Link said. He appreciated how casually she'd mentioned the first Tattle. Maybe they were finally starting to heal old wounds. Still, that's wild. So much has happened since then. I wonder how differently things will be 23 days from now. Tattle laughed. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll finally be done with this cycle and living in a new day. That prompted another thought for Link. Do you think that time passes the same in Hyrule? So that when I go back, it will have only been a month. Tattle's smile faded. It took her a minute to reply as if the question bothered her. I don't know. I guess you'll see when you go back. Link realized where this was headed. I'm not going to leave you, he said. When this is over, I mean. But I can't come with you, Tattle said. Remember everything the mask salesman said? Shadows can't leave this realm, or... Well, I don't know what happens. But I have a theory that the mask salesman tried to take a shadow to Hyrule, and something terrible happened. Link's eyes widened. Really? Who do you think he tried to take back with him? I don't know. I didn't ask. I was his hostage at the time, so I didn't think I had much room to- Why didn't you tell me this before? Tattle scoffed. I tried, but you wouldn't listen. You told me nothing the masked salesman said mattered since he was dead. Yeah, but I didn't think he said anything like that. Why would you believe him anyways? See? The fairy exclaimed. There, that's why I didn't tell you. You get mad at me when I bring him up, so why would I? Link's Sora face blushed. <laughs> I'm justified in being mad at him. He... I know what he did, Link. Let's talk about this later, okay? I think... That might be the fortress. Link swallowed the retort that came next, taking a deep breath. He glanced at the corner ahead and then back to Tattle. <sighs> I just want you to know that I won't abandon you, okay? He said. Ever. I don't care what the mask salesman said. Even if he's right, I'll find a way to make sure I don't cut you out. Like Navi did me. Tattle nodded, though Link saw her uncertainty. For now, they rounded the next corner together. Their rocky cliff sides curved inward, eventually ending at a giant metal gate. It towered hundreds of feet, ending at the same height as Great Bay's border. It appeared to bridge a natural gap in the cliffside, clearly hiding something from the rest of the bay. It contrasted starkly with its natural surroundings and appeared impenetrable. There was no visible way around it, either. That's kind of scary, Tattle said. Yeah, Link said uneasily. He looked to see they'd passed the worst of the underwater rocks, and the current had calmed a bit too. I'm gonna swim up to it instead of hiking the rest of the way. Once Tattle agreed to that, he dove underwater while she flew overhead. He propelled himself through the bay until he treaded water before the massive red gate and the rock ledge at its base. He reached over the ledge and touched the gate's warm metal surface. I feel so small next to this thing, he thought. It was taller than Clocktown city walls and reminded him of Hyrule Castle. Azora surprised them both, breaking the water surface to tread beside them. Ah, oh, Mikael, he said. Link turned to face him, surprised that someone had so easily snuck up on him. Guess I don't have my Zora senses as figured out as I thought, the hero reflected. He waved at the visitor. Hi. What are you doing in a place like this? The Zora asked, dismissing Link's friendly gesture. Ah, will I ever stop being the most awkward Mikau in the world? Link thought. Tattle's smirk made him think the answer was no. This is the pirate's fortress, the Zora said. Like a few of the other Zoras, he possessed a full fish-sized head whose tail hung down to his back. I don't think you should get too close. Maybe... Link said, but I need to get inside. I'll be careful, I promise. How will you get in? The Zora asked. The gate goes underwater all the way to the bottom. There's no way under it, and I've never seen them open it. Link mentally reprimanded himself for not noticing that detail. I'll find a way, he said. 
but it's really important I complete my mission. It doesn't matter what your mission is, the Zora said. You would die trying to get in. The memory of Mikal, floating half-dead in the water, returned to him. Well, what are you doing here? Suddenly, it was the Zora's turn to blush. Well, actually, the pirates in the fortress are all... women. Tattle immediately flew to join the conversation. And? She said, lacing her reply with contempt. And I hear they're all gorgeous, the Zora said. So, I thought maybe I should check them out. Oh, got it, Tattle said sarcastically. So, not only are you a spineless coward, but you're also a pervert? No, he exclaimed. I didn't say that. How can you even see them? Tattle asked. There's a massive gate sitting in front of your face. Well, sometimes they walk across the top, the Zora said. It's a nice angle. You're disgusting. I'm with my fairy on this one, Link said. I wouldn't blame the pirates if it makes them uncomfortable to have a stranger watching them from the shadows. It's not hurting anybody, though, the Zora said. Tattle rolled her eyes. If I had a green ruby for every creep who doesn't understand the definition of stalking... Are you a friend of Mikau's? The Zora asked, trying to change the subject. I didn't know Mikau had a fairy. Oh, I'm his delusional friend that thinks we're related by marriage. Link threw her an angry glance. What? She said. It's the truth. Or the version of it. Right. The Zora said. I'm gonna go now. He looked at the two of them once more before he dove underwater and left. Link sighed. That was rough. Why are all our conversations in Great Bay either awkward or hostile? Probably because you're pretending to be someone you're not, Tattle said. Not that I blame you. I think it's the right move. She paused, looking up at the gate. And I guess we know why this is here now, to keep out perverts. I doubt it, Link said. Well, how are you going to get in, Mr. Deku Brain Zora-faced hero? I can fly over it, but I can't carry out the eggs myself. The mighty gate was too immense to be opened by them. As Link looked closer, however, he noticed something he hadn't before, a flock of seagulls, flying around a particular spot where the gate met the rock ledge. Tattle, Link said, pointing that way. The two went that way, eventually noticing something beneath the water's shimmering surface. Link dove down to explore, sinking all the way to the sandy bottom. He found a small wooden board against the rock ledge's underwater wall. The wood had begun to rot, though a red skull painted on its surface was still visible. Link walked up to touch it, and it relented easily to his pressure. The Zora smiled, swimming back to the surface. I found a way in, Link said, beaming up at Tattle. There's a passageway underwater that's covered up, but the wood's rotted a bit. How convenient, the fairy said, turning to look at the seagulls circling around them. Thank you, my flying friends, for this and for helping us find Miguel. They cawed in reply. Maybe I should fly over while you swim in? Tattle asked. I can try to find where the passage leads and scope it out. Link agreed, and the two of them parted ways. The hero dove underwater, distanced himself from the wooden barrier, and then he swam at full speed toward it, spiraling the whole way. The wood shattered on impact, and Link swam through the dark passageway. When Zora Link stepped out of the secret underwater cave, he was on the side of the gate. The massive fortress was now visible across an artificial lake. Rock walls enclosed on all sides, save for the entrance blocked by the metal barrier. A second, smaller gate blocked off the fortress proper on the lake's end. Boats patrolled the lake, each manned by a warrior with a spear. From his vantage point at the cave's mouth, he couldn't see over the second gate, but was still high enough to remain hidden from the guards. He remembered flying over the lake and spotting one of the patrols. As a skull kid, the hero remembered. He'd flown down to the unsuspecting guard, smiling. As the imp, it had been fun to kill her. Link had flicked his wrists and purple flames had enveloped her. Then, he'd flown over the last barrier and slain all of them. He remembered them burning, writhing. A small fire began in Link's chest, 
It was an overwhelming desire to release that dark magic once again upon the warriors who could not oppose it. That flame grew steadily until it hammered in his ears. Link? Tata asked. The hero returned to himself. A sharp pain stung when he refused the scar's magical call. Link placed his hand over his chest and winced. Are you okay? <sighs> yeah, Link said bitterly. He removed his hand and saw a black speck on his smooth Zora skin. No, he thought. The scar was far worse on his Deku form, but as Darmani, none of the black mark had ever made it through. I guess nothing instigated the scar while I was Darmani, the hero reflected. Returning to the site of the pirate slaughter had been a ruthless trigger. Is it the mark? Tata asked. Yep, he said, straightening himself. <sighs> Remember when I torched the forest and the swamp? How can I forget? I was looking through the eyes of the Skull Kid then, and he killed everyone here. I experienced it. Tattle gulped. And for a moment just now, you were tempted to do the same? Link's expression darkened. I don't plan on killing anybody if we can sneak through. Right, Tattle said. But... We have to be ready to do what we need to, for Termina, and for everyone else in it. Another memory surfaced for Link, this time a death at his own hands. Ganondorf, spitting up blood at the top of Hyrule Castle, turned Gan's fortress. Yeah, the boy said, but killing a person is always a last resort. Even as he thought of the Skull Kid's wickedness again, he realized he may have to kill the Imp one day, He'd come close more than once. Well, Tattle said, determined to lighten the mood. I can distract the guards if I have to, like I did at the Deku Palace. Link smiled. You are an expert at that. Although, Tattle trailed off, looking at the Gerudo women in their boats. These ladies don't look like they mess around. I doubt they'll be as gullible. Link nodded. The pirates wore veils over their mouths, and their green eyes stared ahead sternly, red hair tied back. Their dark skin was resilient to the sun, and their sparse purple uniforms did not leave much to the imagination. There were four boats in total, giving them a complete view of the lake's perimeter throughout each ship's rotation. They know how to wield their looks like a weapon, I'll give them that, Tattle said. Probably just as dangerous as their spears. The fairy paused, smirking when the boy gave no commentary. Is the allure of the Gerudo pirate not a factor for the hero of time? Link frowned. No, it isn't. He paused. Zelda was kind of an exception for me. I've never really found anyone else. He trailed off, unsure how to explain. Ah, Tattle said, feeling the silence for him. She took the hint to drop her sarcasm. Zelda... Must have been really special then. She was, Link said, his aura voice wavering even more than usual. He stared ahead at the second gate, determined to change the subject. I can't talk about this, the hero thought. Not right now. So, what's the plan? Tattle asked. I think we should look for a way underwater again, Link said. I can't spot a way to get through the next gate, plus the lake will keep me hidden. Right. So, should we hope they don't mind the fairy wandering around the fortress aimlessly? I don't exactly blend in. I am a bright ball of white light with wings. Link considered. Do you think you could hide in my human form? Excuse me? Like, my bag, sword, shield, and bottles. They're all with me right now, but the mask is hiding them with human me. What if I put you in my bag and then put the mask on? Uh... Where would I go? Some blank void with all your other items? Do you think there's air there for me to, you know, breathe? Uh, ideally, Link said, realizing he'd never thought through that logic. Maybe I can try and find a way to climb up the wall as a human? That way you can just hide in my bag without making it disappear, surely? Nah, don't worry about it, Tattle said. I don't like taking chances on either of those options. I'll fend for myself while you find a way underwater. If I can find a way to sneakily reunite with you, I will. Otherwise, 
I'll scope things out for myself. I imagine our loot won't be waiting on pedestals labeled Zora Eggs when we get in. Are you sure? Positive. Okay, Link said. Just be safe. You too, Fishhead. Link smiled, turning back to the lake and mentally planning his route. Two close calls with patrol boats, a spiky mine, a secret maze of tunnels, and one more red-painted block of wood later, Link made it around the last gate. He emerged from a room tucked away at the gate's bottom, from the inside, and observed the enormous plaza. It was open to the cloudless midday, and several enclosed sheds and storage facilities dotted the fortress along the walls, stacked atop one another, and fanned out to take up most of the perimeter. There was a large crate sitting near Link's doorway, and Mikao's visage crouched behind it before anyone saw him. A wooden watchtower towered above all from the plaza's center. A ladder ran its entire length, and it was roofed, too. A long bridge connected it to the top floor on Link's left. That floor's enclosed room drew a lot more attention to itself than the others. It was ornately decorated and clearly signified a leader's den. One guard stood on the bridge connecting the watchtower to the alleged throne room, and she had a bird's eye view of the entire fortress. Aside from that guard, several other pirates filled the fortress. They loitered next to rooms and chatted, or else vigilantly kept watch. It was a vibrant community with a dutiful chatter filling the air. Link was thankful he'd run into no one. The room he'd exited was an access tunnel to some sewer systems beneath the second gate. It made sense why it was not occupied. Link sighed. This will not be fun, he thought. The hero didn't want to take chances, running between crates and rooms, until he knew where he was headed. The watchtower and throne room seemed obvious targets, but reaching them would be a challenge. And it wouldn't be worth it if the eggs weren't there. Link scanned the skyline for a while, deciding that he should wait for Tattle. He made himself comfortable from behind the crate, removing his Zora mask and drinking water from one of the seven bottles he'd procured. <sighs> Can't wait to ditch all of these. His bag was large and portable, but it did not have infinite capacity. Bottles were bulky, especially alongside his five other masks, bow, and a quiver. For now, he'd remain a human in case he needed his bow. After a few undisturbed minutes, a white dot appeared in the sky. Link smiled as Tattle blended in with the midday. Maybe we were a little overcautious about her being noticed, he thought. Link did his best to signal to her without alerting the guards, and eventually, his fairy returned to his side. The front entrance? Tattle said, eyeing Link's position right by the main gate. Clever. It's where the sewer system led, Link said just as softly. Did any of the pirates see you? Yeah, but they didn't care. Something tells me they'll be a little concerned when they see a Zora or a human trying to run through, though. Did you figure out where the eggs are? Up there. Tattle said, pointing to the throne room. Got it, Link said, unsurprised. But I don't know how to make it there. Well, I mean, not with the pirates around. Thankfully, you've got your bow. Link's stomach sank. I don't like that. Killing monsters and killing people are two different things. These people are monsters, Link. They killed Mikau and stole the Zora eggs. They're in cahoots with the Skull Kid. They're murderers and thieves. That didn't stop them from screaming just like anybody else when the imp burned them. Link said solemnly. Tattle's face hardened. Link, they're all going to die when the moon falls anyways. Everyone will. And I know you're tired of hearing that excuse, but I think it carries extra weight when you consider that these pirates are evil and standing in your way to save the Zoras. If the other options is giving up and letting Majora win, I know what I'd choose. <sighs> I know, Link said, his voice heavy. Is this how the mask salesman justified what he did? The boy thought, doing what needed to be done to save Hyrule? You know, Tattle said, surprised by his agreement. Link looked at the pirate standing on the high bridge. There really is no other way, he thought. She'll see me no matter where I go, instantly. Are you sure this is the right choice? Link asked. The fairy hesitated again. 
Is she surprised I agreed? Link thought. Or is she having second thoughts now that I'm about to do it? Link retrieved his bow and notched an arrow. It's not just her, he said. Those guards on the right wall will see me kill her and I'll have to kill them too. And anyone else that notices as I start to run for the ladder. Tattle swallowed nervously. <laughs> I meant what I said. If it's the only way, then it's the only way. Nehru, forgive me, Link thought. He peeked out from behind the crate and fired his first arrow. It zipped through the sky and snagged the pirate walking along the bridge. His blood-soaked projectile glistened as she stumbled into the railing and tumbled over. Her spear fell from her hands as she plummeted to the cold stone ground. The guards on the right, as predicted, noticed their fallen comrade immediately. They jumped to their feet, and as one opened their mouth, a second arrow silenced her. The other comrade beside was quick to die next. One by one, screams and shouts for help were snuffed before they could draw breath. By this point, Link had already abandoned his crate and was in plain sight, another arrow drawn and looking for the next target. Two more pirates on the second story noticed them, but they were in Link's line of sight first. He killed them, too, and soon, the body count was at six. Link and Tattle remained alert, but no other guards were directly in sight. The boy lowered his bow, feeling sick to his stomach. I never missed, Link realized. His archery skills, for the first time in his life, suddenly felt like a burden. Tattle remained deathly silent as they crept quietly across the plaza. This is the dark side of being a warrior, Tattle, Link thought. Not everyone fighting for evil is a mindless monster. They reached the ladder, and the boy stowed his bow and scaled it swiftly alongside his flying companion. Link made it to the top without being noticed. He ran across the bridge to the ornate building at its end. He slid his sword free and stepped inside. The metal hallway was familiar to Link. It was decorated like the sewer exit's interior, bland, silver, and industrial. Sword at the ready, he and Tattle passed through and kept their eyes open for more guards. The hallway eventually opened onto a small balcony overlooking a room, which is as grandiose as its exterior. There is a ladder leading down into it. But Ling quickly realized there were people there. He crouched at the last moment, noticing the hallway diverted to the right. Link followed that branching pathway, and even though it led to a dead end, there was a small barred window allowing them to observe the main room's conversation. His instincts that it was a throne room had been correct. It was as metallic as the hallway with a grated floor and silver plating over the walls. However, an ornate chair at the far end marked it as a room of significance. A long maroon couch had spears shooting up from its back, and a red banner hung on the wall behind it, showcasing a skull and two crossed scimitars. A woman stood in front of the chair, standing with confidence and authority over another woman. Unlike the other pirates, the leader's summer outfit was laced with gold and red rather than purple. The Pirate Queen's audience member was dressed in breathable white harem pants and a shirt, and she bowed her head in respect. Other guards littered the room, though they had their backs turned away from the audience. The patrol stood near a stash of loot in the room's center. Rupees, maps, and trinkets were thrown into a pile and surrounded a large treasure chest. A fish tank sat against the wall to the left of the pirate leader. It had a clam-like creature resting at its sandy bottom, and something else that was small and green. An egg, Link realized. The tank had a locked door at its side, but the top was open. The boy didn't think he was tall enough to climb it, though. So you didn't find the rest of the eggs, the pirate leader said. Her arms were crossed, and her disdain for the woman bowed before her was obvious. Unexpectedly, Tattle gasped. Link's head immediately snapped to the side. At first upset, she'd broken the silence. But there was a large wasp coming right at her. The insect's pointed stinger was threateningly bared as it flew at them, but his fairy managed to avoid it. The creature flew through the secret window's bars and toward a nest on the throne room ceiling. Several more identical wasps buzzed around it. The pirate in white struggled to reply, recapturing the boy and fairy's attention. No, but, but that's because- What are you trying to pull here? The leader exclaimed. 
If people hear the great pirates have lost the treasure they stole, we'll become the laughing stock of Termina! Yes, but, but Avail, the sea was so murky when the sea snakes attacked us and... Silence! Avail, their leader, said. I don't care for your excuses. We only have four eggs here, so you need to find the other three before the sea snakes or Zoras get to them. The eggs are the only lead we have to understand that dragon cloud floating over the bay. If what that strange masked one says is true... Havel trailed off. Then getting inside will be well worth any cost. So do what you must, and hurry! A veil gestured outward to signal her dismissal. The pirate in white considered resisting more, but eventually bowed in submission. Understood. She turned to leave, and Link and Tattle exchanged a horrified glance. As soon as she leaves, she'll find those six bodies, the boy thought. The hero's eyes darted from the pirates to the wasp's nest above them. The servant was already halfway across the room. Link sighed, drawing his bow and aiming through the bars. Link! Tattle whispered, but there was no time to consider another idea. The boy released his arrow, and it struck the wasp nest on the ceiling. It fell to the floor and exploded. Hundreds of deadly yellow-black insects filled the room in a swarm, attacking all of the pirates, including a veil. Panic quickly ensued. Screaming, shouting, and arm-waving overtook the once orderly throne room, but none of the shrieking did anything to deter the wasps. Eventually, they surrendered the throne room and fled outside. The wasps followed them out the door. It closed behind them, cutting off the screaming and furious buzzing. Only a handful of wasps remained in the room to fly around aimlessly. Oh, nice one, Tattle said bitterly. Now they're all out the door to find the bodies together! But hopefully distracted by wasps long enough for us to make a getaway, the boy said, stowing his bow. He ran around to the ladder and descended into the room. Link initially walked toward the fish tank, but stopped to eye the treasure chest in the loot pile. It was a deep, rich brown, and it was lined with gold. Link, come on, Tattle said. We don't need the rupees. We have an infinite supply that replenishes in the stock pot in every cycle, remember? I just want to see what's inside, Link said. It'll take a second. He went to work on latching it, convinced that if the rupees were on the floor around it, something else would be inside. Tattle sighed in obvious disapproval, but flew to join him nonetheless. He swung the chest slid open and eyed what lay within. He felt a golden light should be shining dramatically inside, because this was an incredible find. Link almost instinctively grabbed the item and held it over his head victoriously, but instead, Link merely smiled. What's that? Tattle asked. Something I've owned before, Link said, unable to suppress his excitement. It looks a little different, but that's definitely the same thing. He lifted the small metal contraption free. It was golden with a handle on one end and a sharp pointed end on the other. In between, a bulky cylindrical shell hid the device's machinery from view. It was compact but heavy. What's it called? Tattle said. A hook shot. A what what? Link steadily aimed at the wall to demonstrate, closing an eye as if pointing an arrow. When he pressed the trigger on the handle, the sharp end rocketed at a lightning-fast speed. A chain kept it tethered to the rest of the contraption, and it never slackened. The pointed end struck the metal wall and made a clinking noise. Rather than falling to the floor afterward, the entire chain remained erect as it retreated to the handheld device. Soon, the pointed end was back in place, and the rather lengthy chain was back to being bundled beneath the metal shell. It was rather noisy throughout the process, and Tattle's wide eyes beheld it with awe. What the dim was that? Tattle exclaimed. That thing just defied like five laws of physics! There's no way that entire chain could fit in that little thing, and it really should have blown you across the room considering how fast it shot out, and it's gotta be unbelievably heavy to hold all that metal inside! Link smiled, examining the golden hookshot with gratitude. It's actually only a little heavy, and no one knows how they work. They were crafted by some ancient civilization long ago, and there aren't many of them. I had one in Hyrule, but how crazy is it that I happened to come upon another one here? Pretty crazy, Tattle said, redirecting her attention to the tank. But we 
We should really focus on getting this egg and finding the others. She flew up to the tank, but quickly found the door was locked. How are we going to get in? The hookshot, Link said. Look, I know you found a fancy new instrument and want to have some fun, but those guards will be back any second. Link replied with a demonstration. He placed it on the ground and applied his Zora mask. Then, Link picked it back up and leveled the hookshot to aim above the open tank. The fairy saw it was aimed at a wooden panel there. Link pulled the trigger, and the chain shot out. The pointed end latched itself firmly into the wood, and instead of returning to Link, the mechanism pulled itself through the air, upward towards the latching point. And most wondrous of all, Link held onto it and zipped along with it. When the handle reunited with the hook, Link had journeyed across half the room and now dangled above the fish tank. The Zora released the pointed end and then fell, falling into the water below. Tattle's jaw fell open in shock, watching from outside and shaking her head, in either approval or disapproval. The Zora sank to the bottom with the hookshot still in hand. The tank was rather small, only composed of the minuscule round thing he'd seen from afar and the clam. The round object was definitely an egg. It seemed soft, and its green-white shell squirmed with faint signs of life. Before Link could approach it, the clam turned, standing between him and the egg. The creature had razor-sharp teeth lining its mouth, and it opened to reveal moist, red innards stringing together in two halves. Then, it lunged at the intruder. Link barely sidestepped it, moving the egg out of the way with his feet. The clam cut into his right arm and brought a thin line of blood with it, bubbling in the tank water. The clam landed and turned to strike again, but this time, Link was ready. He fired his leveled hook shot. The chain shot out, and the pointed end sliced through the innards. The clam's two halves disconnected. It floated, dead, as the chain returned to his home. Link examined his new cut. It's not bad he thought. He decided to ignore it for now, scooping the egg gently into his free hand instead. It was as soft as he'd guessed, and he could feel its faint pulse. But it's not very strong. One wrong move, and its fleshy shell would come apart. He swam to the surface and climbed out of the tank, sitting on its edge as he removed the Zora mask and becoming instantly dry. Link took out an empty bottle, scooped some of the tank water into it, and then slid the egg inside, sealing it shut. So it works underwater, too? Tattle asked as Link placed his hookshot in his bag. Yep, he said, falling to the floor with the egg in hand. Is there anything it can't do? She asked. If you aim it at the moon, will it shoot back into the heavens? Do we just find the savior of Termina? Link rolled his eyes, showing her the egg. Right, business. She flew to his bottle and examined it. So, this is what we're after? I guess so. It looks so weak. The pirates said they only have three more in the fortress? Link nodded. Then we should do it fast, Tattle said. Link put the egg away with his other belongings, looking around the room to find more clues. All he saw were those same stray wasps who'd lost interest in chasing intruders. They should be back by now. Tattle said, suddenly growing suspicious as she turned to the throne room door. Surely the wasps couldn't distract them for this long. Maybe they decided to look for the killer somewhere else in the fortress? Tattle rolled her eyes. Surely they're not that stupid. I mean, what are the chances? A wasp nest happens to fall on your head and then you run outside to find everyone dead? I highly doubt anyone could think that's a coincidence. She paused. But let's go outside the way we came. That way, we'll have the high ground. They crossed the throne room, opened the door, and carefully stepped back into the open-aired fortress, and immediately smelled fire. From their vantage point, the smoke bellowed from the plaza. At the wooden watchtower's base, purple flames licked upward to consume it. The beams supporting it were crackling and splintering while screams rose up from the besieged pirates. Link and Tattle stared in shock, realizing why the pirates hadn't returned to the throne room. They found the culprit. A shadow stood on the watchtower across the bridge from them. It was a shadow of Link, and its eyes were red. It stared directly at the boy and fairy it sought to kill. Dark Link had found them. The shadow retrieved its bow and notched an arrow in one fluid motion. It never took time to aim. 
Thankfully, Link's instincts had him draw his shield first, and the arrow deflected off of it. He drew his sword and stood ready to fight on the bridge's other end, his blue eyes shining with a threat as they observed the enemy. This time I'm not injured, the boy thought. He would confront the demon here and now. He would end this. However, Dark Link took a deep breath and closed its eyes, and when it opened them, they were purple. Link's resolve melted away immediately. Hey, Tattle began, but she never finished her sentence. The shadow threw its arms forward and conjured fire. The massive wave of purple energy incinerated the bridge as it progressed, hurtling after the boy and fairy without hesitation. Link had no other option but to leap off the high ledge. The sphere of fire immediately passed over where he'd been standing, slamming into the throne room door and destroying it. The bridge had been reduced to ashes that blew away in the firestorm's gales. Link was in freefall, grabbing his Goron mask and putting it on. He rolled into a ball and slammed into a wall to stop his momentum. Goron Link fell to the floor, unrolling as he stood. And unexpectedly, his arm seared with pain. He clutched it as Tattle joined him. How did Dark Link just do that? Tattle said, screaming above the chaos. Darmani was distracted, however. His right arm was swollen and purple, and a piece of wood stuck from it. At first, he thought he'd cause that injury, but Link realized it was filled with pus. <clears throat> this was from the Gorman brothers, Link realized, when the awning collapsed. At the time, the wound had seemed minor, but clearly the injury had festered within the mask's magic. Tattle noticed the infection herself. What happened to your arm? <sighs> that doesn't matter. Link said in his deep Goron voice. Dark Link, he... he's here. He used magic. The two turned to see the shadow standing atop the watchtower. The demon leapt off it, and purple flames shot from the soles of its feet. Then, it flew through the air like a terrifying flying machine, propelled forward by dark magic. Link! Tattle screamed. The Goron turned to see the nearest door, ignoring the pirates who fled and screamed in terror. He ran up to it, but the handle was locked. Link forced it open anyways, using his uninjured shoulder to bust the door in. Meanwhile, the watchtower snapped in half, finally tumbling into the plaza and bursting into flames. When Link forced his way into the room, Dark Link was already halfway to them, a river of fire trailing behind. Inside... Link found two guards in a small storage room, spears ready and pointed at them. They screamed and began to charge. Link rolled into a ball and crashed into the ground, causing both women to fly painfully backward, disarming them. Link kept rolling down an adjacent hallway, away from the real threat coming closer. Link exited his ball to examine the larger room he'd rolled into. It was mostly empty with a door on the other end of a small staircase, and a pirate stood right in front of Link. It was a veil. The leader saw the Goron and drew two golden pommeled scimitars from behind her, brandishing them. Who are you? She demanded. The overwhelming pain in Darmani's arm was too much for Link to bear, so he removed the Goron mask and returned to his human form. He drew his sword and shield while a veil gasped at the transformation. She backed away, holding the blades without a little less confidence. That doesn't matter! Link said, hoping he wouldn't have to use his weapons. There's a demon who will kill us both, coming down the hall right now. We don't have to fight. Havel's wrinkled brow quickly narrowed itself into a threat. No, it does matter. You're clearly as much a demon as he is. She stepped forward and swiped her swords in a threat. She paused before striking, however, when she made a realization, looking from the door to the hero. You wouldn't come this way unless you were here for the eggs. That demon and you are here together, aren't you? Steal them! Link stammered. He had no idea more eggs were in this direction. I... I ha, it takes courage to come thieving in the pirate's fortress. I'm going to love doing this to you. Yeah. Havel charged, swinging her blades to kill. Link brought up his shield and deflected the blows. He tried to turn her around with his shield, but Avail escaped that grasp and struck at his leg. Link barely sidestepped that blow and lashed out with his own. 
A veil blocked it with crossed blades, but Link maintained his stance when she threw him off. The next time she swung a sword, Link used his shield to forcefully match its momentum. A veil staggered backward, and her second sword swing went wide. Link brushed it away and slashed into her side. A veil screamed, falling to the floor as she bled. Link raised his sword again, seconds away from ending her life. The pirates screamed as death came for her. But Link stopped short. There was no reason to kill her. He shook, surprised by his own bloodlust as the woman cowered before him. An image of the masked salesman flashed across his mind, forcing him to his knees with the re-dead mask. I am not like him, the boy thought. Finish it! Havel exclaimed as she held her wound and trembled. But Link sheathed his sword. He said nothing as he ran up the staircase and went through the next door with Tattle. Avail's eyes went wide with shock when the boy left. She remained on her knees, shaking as she took her hand away from the wound and saw more blood. This is bad, she thought. He humiliated me. He cut me deep. <laughs> Avail looked up, however, when she felt another presence. The demon, as the boy had called him. Its eyes were once again red, and it stood where the green-clothed youth had seconds ago. They looked just alike, she realized. Two magic users come to destroy my home. She tried to meet the shadow's terrifying face with courage, but it didn't care about her. The demon merely walked around her and up the stairs, pursuing the boy. A veil remained laying there in her own defeat. Ling and Tattle entered a mostly empty room, except for a fish tank and another door on the opposite end. Three Zora eggs, similar to the other one Link had found, were inside. The boy sprinted at the tank, slammed his sword into the glass, and stepped aside as water rushed out. The eggs, as well as another monstrous clam, squirmed in the dry air. The guardian's sharp mouth was no threat while dry. It flailed aimlessly as it died. Link quickly began bottling up the other eggs with the tank's remaining water. While bottling the second one, the previous door opened behind him. Dark Link stepped inside, red eyes no longer wielding the imp's magic. The boy had planned on this, however, and reacted instantly. The hero fired his prepped hookshot. The pointed end rocketed forward at an alarming speed, piercing through the shadow's face. Its red eyes vanished as the chain sprung out the back of Dark Link's head and tapped the far wall. The hookshot's chain then retracted, going back through the shadow's face and returning home, free of blood. Dark Link swayed in place for a moment. Its face was now a gaping hole. The shadow collapsed and fell to its side, motionless. Link didn't pause to celebrate. He finished corking the two remaining eggs, returning them to his bag, and ran for the remaining door. He looked back before leaving the room. Dark Link was already moving again. The hole in its face shrank as its face reconstructed itself. Faeror, save me! Link thought. He hadn't expected the hookshot to kill it, but it was still horrifying to watch the monster rebuild itself. The door returned him to the plaza and ran for the secondary gate sealing off the lake. The guards were in too much chaos to notice as the boy fled. By the time Link reached the gate's top, he looked down to see Dark Link on the plaza floor, once again with an uninjured face. The shadow closed its eyes, took a deep breath, and opened them so that they were purple once more. Link didn't hesitate. He put on his aura mask and jumped off the gate, barely avoiding the blast of purple fire that came for him. Mikau dove into the lake, which was now free of guards. He swam for the larger metal gate that promised to take him back to Great Bay. He propelled himself underwater toward the wooden hole he'd made earlier. Then, he left the fortress behind. The snowy landscape relentlessly bombarded the Skull Kid as he flew west. Despite the cold, the Skull Kid closed his eyes and concentrated to check on the shadow again. He saw through Dark Link's eyes. The demon stood on a rocky shore, looking out onto an ocean and flinking fire into its watery surface. This accomplished nothing, however. The boy and fairy appeared long gone. The shadow could not follow the hero underwater. When Dark Link felt the presence of the imp, it stopped shooting fire and waited.
You have failed me again, the Skull Kid said. The Shadow said nothing. Return to me at once. You must be punished. Yes, yes master. master. The imp watched from the Shadow's perspective as it began walking along the path it had come from, back to Snowhead. The Skull Kid left the demon's mind and returned to the wintry mountains. Punished. Majora posed it as a question. He needs to learn how intolerable failure is, the imp said. And what of your failures? The Skull Kid didn't respond, pursing his lips from behind the mask. Be careful. You are treading in dangerous water, child. My patience is wearing thin. The Skull Kid flew onward regardless. His mind was made up.